that's funny. Hey everyone, and welcome to our live event with Heather Thomas. Once again, thank you so much for being here to answer all of everyone's quilting questions. Thanks for having me. It's great to be back. Of course. All right, we're going to get right uh, right to it with our first question here from Karen. And she wants to know, what is the best way to store my spools of thread? Well, Karen, you know, one of the things about storing your thread is that you want to make sure that it stays clean. Um, and once you've taken the plastic wrap, if, if it had plastic wrap on it, um, it's going to get dirty if you leave it out. Um, I store my thread in matchbox um, storage containers. You can get them at the big box stores like Walmart or Target. And they have these little um, uh, compartments, like 30 on each side. And each compartment will fit either a large spool or four small spools. And so I've got about 10 of those that I keep my threads in. Um, I like them because they are, the, the lids um, uh, clamp down tightly, but they're not, um, uh, you know, like Tupperware. You don't want anything like Tupperware because it's too airtight. And if there's anything dirty on the thread, it can actually cause it to, you know, grow mold and stuff like that. Um, I wouldn't store them out at, on a hanging rack, you know, like a thread rack that's hanging on the wall, unless, you um, tacked up uh, a piece of clear um, uh, heavy duty plastic uh, that kind of acted as a drape over them. So you can still see the colors and see where everything is, but that clear plastic will keep the bulk of the dust off of them. And the dust that we're talking about is not your everyday dust, but mostly most of the dust that's out and about is our sloughed off skin, which is dirty and oily. So we don't want that all over our thread. So your best bet is someplace that is enclosed um, but not airtight, um, and my your best bet is those those matchbox um, car little matchbox car holders. They run about seven dollars, and and so they're wonderful. Like you can hold like sixty or seventy spools in each one, and I just put a little label on the on the front of them, and they're stacked, so I know exactly what's in each container, and it just works wonderfully. Looks like I'm gonna have to change up my thread storage because I have the hanging on the wall, but they look really good. Yeah. <laughs> All right, our next question here is from Anita. She says she is learning to quilt with a machine and she wants to know what she should practice first. Well, Anita, you know, that's an interesting question because I think most quilt teachers usually say, oh, learn to stipple. Um, and certainly stippling is a good way to, to practice. Um, however, most human beings are either one or the other when it comes to their creative um, abilities. They're either a classic or a romantic. And romantics love the curvy line. It comes natural to them. But uh, classics, the straight line comes better and easily, more easily for them. So if you're a classic, learning to stipple might be difficult, whereas if you're a romantic, learning to stipple would be easy. Whatever you, whatever you start with, start with something very, very simple, an all-over pattern. And practice that one pattern until you feel you're good at it, maybe 30 minutes and then move to a pattern that's similar to it and has a little bit greater amount of difficulty to it and then practice it for a while. What I did when I um, was really concentrating on teaching machine quilting is I made a bunch of 10 inch squares. Um, so I just layered a 10 inch piece of fabric um, with batting and backing and I quilted each one of those 10 inch squares differently. I did like 160 of them and I had all these different patterns that I could then turn and look to when I was trying to decide what I was going to quilt where on my next quilt. So it's a really nice way to practice, but also put together a library, um, if you will, of designs. Um, whatever you do, what you're looking for when you're practicing is that your stitch length is consistent, meaning that it's about the same length all the time. And you want to practice making your, your curves smooth and your straight lines straightish. Um, perfectly straight is not going to happen unless you use one of those fancy new rulers, and I'm not sure that perfectly straight is the way to go, but it's up to you. Um, and then you also want to make sure that you're keeping your stitch lines equidistant from each other so that you have a, a very consistent negative space between the stitch lines. So those are the two things that you're really practicing, or the three things, is smoothness of line, um, uh, equidistant um, negative space or space in between your stitch lines, and a consistent stitch length, okay? Perfect. All right, our next question here is from Kitty. She says, how do you choose the best design or pattern to use 
for the different fabrics you've chosen? How do you do determine things like block design and size? That's a big old question. I could talk about this for a couple of days. <laughs> um, first of all, it's all about your skill set and what it is you want to learn and what it is you like. You know, if you don't like stars, don't make stars. If you do like stars, you know, buy, make stars. One of the things I highly suggest if you don't already have one is instead of buying books that say make this quilt, buy books that say here's a whole bunch of blocks. Um, there's some great books around the block one more time or once again or something like that by Hopkins. I think it's Hopkins. I might be wrong on that. But anyway, um, there's lots of block books out there. Make sure that the block book that you buy shows you a picture of the block and gives you cutting instructions for that block for multiple sizes so that you can make it in a six inch block and a nine inch block and a 12 inch block and so on. Um, once you have one of those books, you can simply say, okay, well, I've got these fabrics and one of the fabrics, fabrics has a relatively large print that I really like and I don't want to cut up very much and I've got coordinating fabrics to go with it. Then you can find a block that has at least one unit that is really large, like the center of a square. And that's where you can use that big print so you can see more of it. And then use the, the coordinating fabrics around that. Always consider, um, you know, can I use that large print also at, either as sashing or an inner border or an out, outer border. The best thing I can tell you too is to look at a lot of quilts. If you don't have any quilt books, invest in a few. You don't need a million of them or magazines so that you can see how other people use fabrics. And don't just look at the quilt and say, oh, I think that quilt's pretty. Look at that quilt and say, why do I think that quilt's pretty? And chances are it's because the way they use the fabric. Experience is what's gonna, hap gonna make it uh, work for you. Um, you're probably gonna make some ugly quilts along the way, Lord knows I have. Um, it takes a while to uh, break yourself of the habit of copying somebody else's quilt in a pattern and using very similar fabrics in that um, and going out on your own. Uh, keep in mind that not only are there differences in color in fabrics, but there's also differences in scale of the prints on those fabrics and differ differences in color scale in the colors, meaning you've got lights, mediums, darks, tints, tones, shades, pure hues, all those things. Variety is very important to make a quilt interesting, but we also need unity. So those the things that have variety also have a little bit of unity. You're repeating certain ideas over and over, and that unity makes things look as though they belong. And so that's a one of the best things I can tell you is when you're looking at your stash of fabrics you're thinking of using for a quilt is ask yourself, does it have enough variety? Is it interesting when I look at it? But also do all the things have something in common too, which creates the unity. Okay. Perfect. I just want to point out because you mentioned all sorts of things about color and shade and tint and tone and all of that. And if uh, those are a lot of terms that maybe you haven't heard of or are unfamiliar with, Heather does have a class on the website that covers everything you need to know about color and choosing color for your next quilt. So if you want to um, have more information than you'll probably ever need on color, uh, Heather <laughs> is the one to give it to you and that class is available. All right, our next question here is from Carol and she says she has a pattern for a quilt that measures 40 by 48 when finished. She needs it to be more like a queen size when completed. So she wants to know, is there an easy formula to enlarge or reduce pattern sizes? Well, you know, um, I, I, there's no easy formula, but there's a relatively easy formula. Um, first of all, uh, because I don't know which pattern it is that you're talking about, sometimes you can simply make more blocks. But if the blocks are small, making more blocks for a really big quilt can end up looking kind of clunky. Um, and bigger quilts generally look best with bigger blocks. So not knowing the size of the block is difficult or the type of block because different blocks get blown up in different ways. Um, but that being said, let's talk about something as simple as a nine patch and then hopefully you can take it from there. A nine patch block is made from nine units and each of those units is exactly the same size, three rows of three. And if you're making that nine patch in a six inch block, then each of those units when finished are two inches because two goes into six three times and there's three blocks over and three or three units over, three units down. So the finished size is two inches. 
We always add a half inch for seam allowance, so the cut size is going to be two and a half inches. So if we want to make that six inch block into a nine inch block or any size that's divisible by two, because I mean, excuse me, by three, because that's how many units we have. So six, nine, 12. Um, then we're going to say, OK, now we're going to make a nine inch block from that nine patch and nine divided by three equals three. So now each of those units is going to be three inches finished. We're going to add our half inch for our seam allowance, and each of those units is going to be three and a half inches cut. So that's a basic idea. You have to look at your block and see how many units are in that block, and then divide. So you know if, if there's six units or four units across and four units down, that's called a 16 patch because there's 16 units all together. And you know because it's a, an even number, you're Best bet is to work with an 8-inch square or a 12-inch square rather than a 9-inch square. So that's kind of a beginning, but it would be really hard for me to give you specific instructions without knowing what that specific block is. Um, but if the block is big enough, if it's 9 inches or bigger, simply make more, and you can get by with that. Absolutely. All right, our next question here is from Margo, and she says she's new to quilting and wants to know how do you decide what type of batting to use? Well, Margo, it depends on how you want to use the quilt. Um, I'm always surprised when somebody says, oh, my favorite batting is blah, and I go, oh, you use that all the time, and they go, yeah, and I say, well, you, do you only make one kind of quilt, and they go, what do you mean? I, well, you know, I use different battings for wall pieces different battings for table runners and different battings for bed quilts. And when it comes to bed quilts, I use different battings depending on how I'm going to use that bed quilt. Um, some battings are very, very warm and some battings aren't very warm. If you like, if you're talking about a love quilt or a bed quilt, a love quilt, something you're going to snuggle with on the couch or you're going to take in your car for storms or whatever, your kids to cuddle with, um, then you probably want something warm. And the warm battings are silk and wool. Um, they're a, a, a animal fiber and they have little barbs on them that inter, interlock with each other and they trap heat. But because they're natural fibers, you don't sweat underneath them. Polyester also has those little barbs and it traps heat, but it's not a natural fiber so it doesn't breathe and you will sweat underneath it. Um, also, if anybody who's listened to this show before, I have to say it again, you know, I don't believe in polyester. I, I can't say I don't believe in it because I know it's actually real, but I won't use it <clears throat> because it's highly flammable. So um, I don't, I kind of take polyester out of the picture unless it's mixed in just a tiny little bit with cotton. Um, so if you're going for warmth, something with a wool or silk blend, blend with cotton, blend with bamboo, blend with both um, is wonderful. Um, if you're going for cool, then go with cotton. Cotton is much cooler. It doesn't have those barbs. The fibers don't interlock with each other, and it doesn't trap heat. Basically, it takes um, four cotton-filled quilts to equal the warmth of one wool or wool silk or wool silk blend quilt. Um, when it comes to wall quilts, I like a, a batting that is very, very dense, whereas those love quilts, I like a batting that's looser um, because I want it to drape. Whereas for the wall, I want something dense so that I, when I quilt it, it becomes stiffer. And so my best go-to bat for that is um, Warm and Natural, which a lot of people use for everything, but I don't like it in a love quilt because it's too stiff for me. Um, but I love it for the wall. However, if I want my quilting to really show up, then I put another layer of batting in there, and that layer is wool. And I put that on the top um, so that it's between the, the Warm and Natural and the top of the quilt. So um, it really shows off the quilting because it's got loft to it that a lot of the other battings don't have. Um, if it's a table runner, however, you know, then I'm going to use just straight old cotton um, because it just works the best. Um, it doesn't distort when I quilt the bejeebers out of it. Um, it, it gets kind of tight and but not as stiff as the piece for the wall. So I tend to have several battings on hand. Uh, one that I'm cutting up and using for smaller things, a big one in case I want to make something big, um, and different types of battings. Uh, I, I choose my batting according to the project at hand. 
So it seems like, I mean, that's kind of a lot of information to, for somebody who's maybe never even shot for batting before. I mean, to learn all this, do you think you just sort of, you know, pick one and try it out and see if you like it and kind of go from there? I, I, you can do that. Um, stick with battings that you can, that you have seen at quilt stores. You might find them at the big box stores too, but unless you see them at the quilt store, don't buy it at the big box store because it means it's a lower end bat batting, generally speaking. Um, be prepared if you're making a queen size quilt to spend around $50 for your batting. If you're buying a $20 queen size batting, it's not going to be a good batting. It's going to fall apart. It's going to give you a heartache. Um, it's going to be hard to work with. Um, and it's just going to make your, your life harder, not easier. Um, I always say if, you know, money's, if money's a thing because quilting is expensive, um, make fewer quilts, but use better quality rather than making tons of quilts and using low quality. Um, at least your time is going to be well spent. If you've never bought a batting before, um, uh, Quilter's Dream makes some of my favorite battings. Empress is my absolute favorite batting by then, and it's a, it's a blend of um, wool and silk and tencel and cotton. Um, it's uh, cotton for breathability, tencel, which is rayon for strength, and the wool and the silk for warmth. Um, it's quite thin, but very warm, and it's a dream to machine quilt. I just, I, I adore it. So. Perfect. Well, we have another question here about batting, and they say, I see you working with black batting a lot. Can you tell me what kind it is and if you ever paint it or finish the edges on your small quilts? Um, the black batting that I use is uh, by um, Hobbs and it is 80% cotton and 20% poly. That is one of those blends that I use. And I have not found a, a solid black that I like that's all cotton or all natural. Um, and I do use a lot of black batting. Um, I do a lot of dark colored things and um, often I like that batting to hang out the edge and for some reason black looks good but white doesn't. And yes, I paint batting all the time. Um, I love to paint batting because I can use it um, hanging out of the edge of an art quilt. Um, when I paint it, it kind of seals the edge of that batting and it, it just gives it a really cool look. Uh, I paint my batting with a mix of um, uh, Dynaflow by Jacquard. Um, Dynaflow is a, it's a, it's a fabric paint that acts like a dye. And I mix it one part paint with three parts water. Um, I put it in a bowl and I immerse the batting down in there and I work that color into the batting, work it, work it, work it, work it. This is all natural batting, not polyester because polyester won't take the dye well. It kind of, I mean, the paint well, it kind of sits inside all those little fullnesses of the poly. Um, anyway, so I stick that batting down in there, work the, the, the paint into it, wring it out really well, lay it out to dry, kind of rumpled up so that the uh, batting wicks up some of that excess paint and has dark uh, lines that move through it, the wonderful mottling. Um, and then when it's dry, I iron it flat and use the heck out of it. So yeah, you can paint your batting. Perfect. All right, and speaking of people who have seen enough of your videos to know that you use black batting a lot, um, we have a comment here from Lonnie who says that she's watched as many of your YouTubes as she could find and she feels like she knows that you know each other even though it's only been a one-way relationship. <laughs> so uh, thank you for, for watching and for definitely learning as much you can from Heather. If you have any questions for her, now is the time to ask them though. Yeah. Hi Lonnie. <laughs> All right, and then our next question here is from Juliana. And she wants to know what products can be used in an artful way but will still wear and wash well. What product? Yeah, what kind, what kind of product? So I'm, I'm thinking uh, if things to use embellishment wise on art quilts, things like that. Okay, well, you know, there aren't a whole lot of embellishments that wash well. Um, and so one of the things that you can think of is um, anytime you're trying a new embellishment or one that you're unfamiliar with, and I have done this with every single embellishment I've ever used. And I did this before I wrote my embellishment book Every time I go to use a new embellishment, the first thing I do is throw it in water and see what happens to it. Um, and I scrunch it up and I put some, some laundry soap on it, whatever I use. I happen to use Synthrapol, so that's pretty easy. And I want to see what happens to it. Does it get misshapen? Does it stretch out? Does it fray? All those things. Because I want to be informed. Um, most of the art quilts that I do, there's the assumption is they're ever going to be laundered. But... Um, I had a dinner party once a long, long time ago, 
and I had been asked to um, make a, a donation piece for a fundraiser and I had finished it before my dinner party and so I hung it on the wall temporarily before I had to take it to the, the organization and it was a an applique quilt all hand applique it was a hand designed basket with flowers very ornate blah blah this is a long time ago hand quilted put it up on the wall and uh, about halfway through the dinner party one of the husbands as he was walking through the room tripped on his own shoe with a glass of red wine in his hand and flung that, flung that red wine all over the wall and all over the quilt. So the quilt had to be washed. Uh, I learned then that I will pre-wash my fabrics forever um, because it was unpre-washed fabric and it ran and I had a nightmare on my hands. So now I test anything new, I wash anything I can um, and I make sure that it can do the things I need it to do. So when it comes to launderability with art quilting and techniques and products, you're always going to be safe with fabric paint. Fabric paint is wonderful. As long as you heat set it, according to the manufacturer's instructions, it is just like dyeing your fabric. So you can do all sorts of surface design, stenciling and stamping and, and you know, using utensils from your kitchen to put you know, designs down on fabric, all sorts of different things. And that's gonna be good for, for laundering. Um, anything that is uh, uh, waterproof, like a glass bead or metal or any of those things that you can hand stitch on, those things can usually be laundered too. Um, however, I wouldn't put them in my washing machine. I would hand wash anything that's hand stitched. Um, but also consider that a lot of times a quilt that gets dirty can be vacuumed to be cleaned or it can be spot cleaned. It doesn't have to be completely submerged in water. So that's an option. Um, if you've uh, purchased any um, embellishment books or art, or art quilting books, um, generally speaking, if you read the book, because a lot of people don't read the books they purchase, they just look through them, um, the author will tell you whether or not something is launderable. Um, when I wrote my embellishment book, I wrote it with a couple of, of other women, and one of the things that we did is we kind of separated the embellishments out between um, uh, surfaces that you begin on, um, soft embellishments and hard embellishments. And generally speaking, the, the softer the embellishment, you would think that that would make it more washable, but the less washable it is. And the harder the embellishment, the more washable it is. So things like Angelina fibers, they don't, they don't launder very well. Fabric foil, which remains soft on the surface, it doesn't launder very well. Glitter, it doesn't launder very well. So these things, you know, uh, aren't something you put on a quilt that's going to get a lot of wear and tear. Hopefully that helps you. Gotcha. And I just want to point out because um, you talked a lot about using different paints and dyes and things and you do have numerous videos on the website showing uh, all sorts of ways you can use that. And because you mentioned the kitchen utensil one, that's got to be one of my favorite ones uh, <laughs> because you do see how you can use literally anything in your kitchen or your house. And yeah. So lots of fun ones to check out, that's for sure. All right, our next question here is from Karen, and she says, how do you clean off all the threads on your design wall? I just use a roller, you know, the same roller that you that you get the lint off. I have a cat, so I'm always having to, you know, get hair off of me. Um, that's the best thing I, I know. I know you can also use, um, depending on what your design wall is made out of, you can always also use one of those um, white erasers, those ones you get to clean, you know, walls with. Um, and it will pull off hair and, and fibers and threads too. Um, so people like to use that because it's a little more um, good for the environment, you know, you know using all that tape. Um, so it's those magic, white magic erasers. Perfect. Both of those things will work. Would you ever use like a vacuum or something or is that too much? It depends on how you've put your design wall up. If, if, it's, if it's really well tacked down to whatever surface substrate it's on, you could vacuum it. But if it's loose on there and you've just wrapped it around something, then vacuuming is going to really stretch it out. Right. Okay. Our next question here is from Trish and she wants to know what needle type and size do you quilt with? And is this the same type and size that you piece with? Oh, good question. Um, we generally piece with a universal um, and usually a size 80 because we usually piece with a size 50 thread. Now that's the norm. I like a sharper needle. I tend to quilt um, mostly with hand dyes and batiks. 
And if you use a lot of batiks, then a sharper needle will actually be much, much nicer. And so I use a top stitch. Well, when I started using top stitch um, to quilt with, I realized that's when it was really good to piece with too. And now that's all I buy is top stitch needles. I use them for piecing and for quilting and they work really well. And I only buy them in, in three sizes. Um, the ones I use the most are size 90, and that's what I use for my machine quilting most of the time if I'm using a 40 weight thread. Um, I piece with a size 80, and sometimes I quilt with that if I'm quilting with a size 50 thread. And then I buy 60s because I also use a 60 weight thread sometimes um, when I when I machine quilt and when I do, you know, thread painting and that sort of stuff. But for most people, size 80 and 90, 90 is really all they need. And if you stick with top stitch, that's really all you need to. Perfect. All right, next question here is from Pixie. And they say they just finished a t-shirt quilt and want to know which is better, quilted or tacked? Well, you know, um, it depends on how it's going to be used. If it's going to a, a young person who's really going to use it, because a lot of times t-shirt quilts go to men or to kids in college and that sort of stuff. And if that's the case and they're going to be using it, um, I would definitely quilt it. Um, the, more, the more stitches that you have holding the three layers together, the longer the quilt is going to last, and that's all there is to it. The less stitches, meaning if it's just tacked in the corners, the less long it's going to last and the less it can be laundered. Um, also, your, your batting options are pretty limited when it comes to tying a quilt too. And so you have, to, you have to choose a batting that says it's okay to stitch 12 inches apart, 10 to 12 inches apart. And generally that's going to be something that's filled with polyester. And remember earlier I said, you know, polyester is from the devil. It smells like smoke. Um, and it catches fire really easy, and it's dangerous, and all that stuff. So um, quilting is always your best bet, um, and quilting no farther apart than two inches is your best bet. Now, I really advocate, in a in a perfect world, no farther apart than one inch, um, but every, every two inches or so, uh, you'll get a quilt that's going to last somebody about 10 years. Um, if you want it to be something that they can pass those, that t-shirt quilt down to their son because it's made out of his motorcycle t-shirts and the son's going to want it, then quilt it every inch. Um, then he'll be able to pass it down. Um, but the more you quilt a quilt, the longer it's going to last. Absolutely. And I know I've gotten this question um, in previous uh, live events, but wanting to know how you quilt like through a, a t-shirt motif. So say it's like got a big printed um, design on the front of it. Do you quilt right through that? Do you quilt around it? I generally will quilt around it and then um, so then highlight some of the lines inside the design too so that I've got some stitching in there about every two inches. And then I'd quilt, quilt um, closer together in the background around that design like every one inch. And doing that throughout the body of the quilt is a really good idea. Quilting around the motif, a few lines inside the motif, and then heavier quilting in the background. Okay, perfect. So you don't have to worry about being afraid to stitch through those printed on t-shirts. No, not at all. Not at all. No. Absolutely. All right. Our next question here um, is from Lonnie, and you touched on this a little bit before, but she just wants to clarify that you advocate washing all fabrics before using them for quilts? I do. I do. I, you know, there's just so much mixed information out there. Harriet Hargrave is the one that first started saying you don't have to wash your fabric. However, people tended to neglect the next line that she said in her book, which was, but you do have to test them. <laughs> so, you know, either wash your fabrics or test them all. And I can't be bothered to test a bunch of fabric. Um, the reason she didn't like washing her fabrics is because she liked all of her layers of her quilt to shrink together so that it looked very old fashioned. And that's great. Um, however, you know, um, you better be prepared to wash your quilt in Synthropol all the time if you have not pre-laundered your fabric. Also, your best bet if you're not going to pre-launder is to keep the same line of fabric in a quilt. Not the same design line, but the same manufacturer so that the gray goods are all the same. That's the base fabric. Then you know they're all going to shrink at the same rate. But if you don't wash your quilt and you've got some fabrics in there that, that, quilt one, that shrink 1% and you've got fabrics in there that shrink 3% and you've got fabrics in there that, sh that shrink 5%, then you're going to have a quilt that has areas that are very tight 
and areas that are very loose after it's been laundered, regardless of how you quilted it. Because that fabric is going to pull in, it's going to shrink. And um, you just don't have as much control. And I'm not a control freak, but I do like being able to predict my outcome. And so if I pre-wash all my fabrics, I know what those fabrics are going to do. In fact, I had bought fabric and then not used it because of the way it laundered. I was like, no, that's not good enough for my quilt, even though I paid, you know, $10 a yard for it. Um, it shrank too much or it pulled in and it wrinkled badly. There's all sorts of ways that a, a fabric can misbehave other than simply running, which is bad enough. So um, I like knowing, you know, what things are going to do. So I pre-launder everything. Do I iron it as soon as I pull it out? No. I wash it in the Synthropol. I throw it in the dryer till it's almost dry. Then I pull it out kind of stretch it out, not stretch, stretch, but, you know, get the any wrinkles out of it, let it finish drying, draped over something, fold it up, and put it in my stash with its other, its same colors. Um, and then when I use it, I iron it, um, sometimes, depending on how I use it. If I'm going to rip it, I'm not going to iron it. But, um, and I rip a lot of stuff, not for piecing, but I, yeah. So anyway, yeah, I pre-wash, Lonnie. I do. And now, just in case someone is, uh, this is the first time they've ever tuned in and they've never heard you say the word Synthropol before, uh, what is it? <laughs> Synthropol, S-Y-N-T-H-R-A-P-O-L. Synthropol is a um, industrial surfactant. And the reason why uh, fabric artists have started using it is because of what it does. It, as it cleans, it pulls out excess dye and suspends that excess dye and pigment in the water and won't let it go back down on the fabric. So as a hand dyer, I can throw in freshly dyed black fabric with freshly dyed pale yellow fabric. As long as the Synthropol is already in the water, I can throw both of those in the washing machine and the colors will not migrate towards each other. All the excess dye that's in there will sit in the water. The water will be pitch black, but I'll pull out my pale yellow fabric and it's still pale yellow because that's what Synthropol does. So I stopped buying other laundry soaps. I use Synthropol for everything. It's the only laundry detergent I have, or, or you know, it's, I just use it. It takes very little, it's very economical. A big, huge bottle of it is $16, I think, and I think it lasts me about six months. So um, it's a great uh, um, product to launder things with. And uh, I always say, whatever you launder your fabric with is what you should launder your quilts with, because that's what you've, trusted to or tested your fabrics with is with that laundry soap and that's what you should turn around and wash your quilts with. Perfect. All right. We have another pre-washing question here. This is from Joelle and she says, so you like to launder your fabric, but what do you do with pre-cut fabrics like five or 10 inch squares or jelly rolls? I don't know what to tell you on that one. Um, I've never used those um, and I know they're very, very popular right now. Um, I think if you're making a quilt from a pattern that's all um, those pre-cuts, and nothing's laundered at all. And it it's those are generally all from the same manufacturer. So they're gonna be the same gray goods. So they should all shrink at the same rate. And so if you use just those in a quilt and then launder that quilt when you're done, you should be fine because they're gonna shrink at the same rate, but launder them in Synthropol in case any of them release any excess color. Um, that's your best bet. Do you have to worry about then the quilt top not shrinking the same as the backing fabric or how do you choose your backing fabric? Yeah, if I if I'm not if I don't wash the top, I'm not going to wash the back. Yeah. Gotcha. I'm going to have everything the same. Yeah. Perfect. All right, our next question here is from Michelle and she says, "How do you choose thread color when you have a cream colored sashing but 21 different batik squared colors in three large nine patch designs?" Okay, well, um, the cream colored sashing would be quilted in cream, um, something that is slightly lighter or slightly darker than the fabric itself so that I can see it while I'm stitching it, but not so much so that it becomes uh, gets too much attention. So very close to the color of the fabric. And then the blocks themselves, what I generally do is I, I, I choose, um, if, it's a, if there's a dominant color, I'll quilt with that dominant color. If there is no dominant color, I'll choose my favorite color. And then I'll choose a very dull medium value of that color, meaning it's going to be a tone. So if I've got jewel colors, you know, I've got fuchsia and violet and blue greens and blues and blue violets. Um, I'd probably stitch with violet. 
and it would be a medium value and it would be very dull. What I do when I test a, a thread is I actually unwind that thread and puddle it, make a little puddle of it on the quilt in various areas to see that it does two things or one of two things. Either I can see it on every single fabric or I can't see it on any of the fabrics. The problem is, is if you can see it on some fabrics, but you can't see it on others, then when you go to stitch out your design, you, it looks like there are breaks in your design when you can't see it. Um, and so that's a problem. So I'm, uh, tones usually work the best because they tend to meld into all the colors. And I usually want my thread color to go away. I want the stitch line to show, the, the concave and the poof around that concave of the stitch line to show rather than the thread itself. Um, so puddle, puddle those threads. And when you're investing in threads, invest in tones. Don't buy the bright, pure hues. Don't buy the pastels. Don't buy the deep, dark shades. Buy the dirty, mid-value tones. And chances are you'll start to have those things that you need when you go to your wall of threads or your container of threads. Perfect. All right, our next question here is from Betty. And she says she's a hand quilter that makes lap size quilts. Sometimes my quilts end up heavy and stiff. Some tell me when you quilt lines close together, it will make your quilt on the stiff side. Does it have anything to do with the batting? It has more to do with the batting than it has to do with how quilt heavy you quilt your quilt. Um, here's the thing is that somewhere along the line, somebody really heavily quilted a quilt that had a really dense batting in it. And they did that several times, and then they decided that if you heavily quilt your quilt, it's going to get stiff. That's not true. Um, I heavily quilt all my quilts, and um, they're not stiff. Sometimes I wish they were more stiff than they are. But uh, there's a very easy way of telling um, how your batting is going to react when it's quilted properly. And let's say, for sake of argument, in my opinion, properly is about every three quarters of an inch to every inch. Excuse me. Um, so I need to know that that batting is going to behave the way I want it to when it's done. If it's a bed quilt, a love quilt, um, I want it to be soft and malleable. If it's a wall quilt, I want it to get stiffer. So what I do when I'm testing out a new batting, if I'm checking out a new batting I've never used before, or if I'm trying to determine what battings to use, is I lay that batting flat on the surface of my hand and I see whether or not it dra the excess drapes off or if it's kind of stiff and it just kind of sticks up or if it does something in between. If it drapes off, that means the batting has really good drape, which means that when I quilt it, it's still going to have drape. It's going to um, come off the corners of my bed beautifully, not with stiff little um, points. If when I hold it like that, it kind of sticks up, that's a really dense batting, and those battings are best for wall quilts. And if it's somewhere in between, those are really great for table topper quilts, like table uh, tablecloths and um, uh, table runners and placemats and that sort of thing. So um, dense battings for the wall, drapey battings for love quilts and bed quilts. And then you can quilt them, you can quilt them every quarter of an inch, and they're still going to drape if they're drapey battings. Perfect. Yeah. All right, our next question here is from Linda, and she says she's been stuck on crosshatch quilting using drywall tape as her guide. She now wants to venture into stencils, and what would you suggest to mark those designs? Um, uh, uh, that's a tough one. Um, Do you even mark designs? Have you ever no, done that before? No. When you machine quilt, you you as you're learning to machine quilt, you can really only train one or the other, either your eyes or, or your hands. And if you mark designs, then you have to train your eye to follow that marked design. If you train your hands, then your hands will learn the movements like your body learns dance movements. And you're freer. Now, I know there's a lot of fear in that, and a lot of people think that quilting design should be perfect, equilateral, unified, always the same, and, um, and so they want to mark. There's nothing wrong with either one of those, but one is far easier. 
So um, I'm always going to go with far easier. I do not like things that are complicated, and I do not like things that are persnickety. Uh, using templates are both complicated and persnickety. Um, you have to follow that line, and um, it's it can be quite difficult to do sometimes. However, if that's the way you want to go, then your issue is how do I put that mark down? Well, uh, there's no real good answer. Um, stay away from the uh, uh, friction friction pins that came out recently. Don't use them. They look like ballpoint pens. Don't use them. The marks come back. Um, stay away from the uh, air erasable markers. Marks come back. Some of the water erasable markers work okay, but don't buy the ones that are two and three dollars each. Buy the ones that are six and seven dollars each. Um, they tend to go away better. However, if any of that ink gets caught in the fibers of your quilt, those, those lines can come back from heat. That heat can be um, body heat, uh, heat from a dryer, heat from the sun if it's laying over the back of a couch. Um, all of those things have chemicals that you're putting on the surface of your quilt, so you need to launder them uh, when you're done quilting. You can use soapstone, which is nice because it's just soap, but you have to constantly sharpen that puppy, um, so it can be tedious. You can use chalk, and there are some great all chalk markers. The powdered chalk markers are the best. They have a little ratchet system in them. You can get a nice fine line. However, you can only mark what you're going to quilt right here. You can't mark the whole quilt because all the chalk will dust off. There are some decent um, chalk pencils uh, that have a little bit of wax in them. Remember, the wax is what tries to make it permanent on the surface of your fabric, so never iron a quilt that has chalk pencil marks on it, and don't wash the quilt to get those marks off. Dust those marks off. So your best bet is a stiff toothbrush to remove those lines. Um, and uh, a tape roller because um, you want to lift them up off the surface. Laundering them, what it does is it activates the dye that whatever the color is, if you're using a color, a colored chalk pencil, and that make, can make it off. Also, if you don't pre-wash your fabrics, you're asking for a nightmare and a half because a lot of the chemicals that are put on the surface of fabrics to make them look pretty on the bolt in the store react to a lot of the markers. So your best bet if you're going to be using any markers is to use pre-laundered fabric. Um, there is a, an interesting little wax marker by Clover, or uh, um, it's a, like a ballpoint pen almost, um, by Clover, and it's called it's a liquid wax pen, and it comes off with, a, with an iron. Um, I've used that before and had relatively good luck. I've had a few lines that didn't come off as well as I would have liked them to. Um, but there, in my opinion, there is no really good marking tool. Uh, they all have limitations, and uh, you can't always see the color you're working on if you, you're marking a quilt that has lots of different colors. Um, and it, it's just, um, I highly recommend um, not marking. Uh, but you can try any of those tools. So if you're not going to mark, then how do you train your hands? Well, you train your hands the way you would train yourself um, to do a new dance step. And so when I teach machine quilting, one of the things I tell people to do is instead of just moving your hands, most people move their hands when they machine, when they machine quilt and when they doodle. What I say is to move your whole upper body. And when you move your whole upper body, you're involving a whole lot more muscles and the muscle memory comes more quickly. If you're only moving your hands, your hands don't have as many muscles in them. There are lots of bonies in there, but not lots of muscles in there. And it, you don't, your, your body doesn't remember it. But what you're trying to do when you, when you don't mark is, as you're learning each new stitch out, is to imprint the movement. So I can feel the movements of my stitches. I can actually stitch a flower in, sitting in front of my sewing machine with my eyes closed because I know exactly how my flower feels, even to scale, because I've done it so many times, and the muscle memory is there. That's what I'm talking about. So when you train your hands and your body, you're training the muscle memory. 
when you're following a marked line, you're, you're concentrating on the marked line and you don't pay attention to what's going on with your body and you're not training for muscle memory. And unfortunately, we can't do both at the same time, we humans. We're not good at it. And so either you follow the line with your eye and you train your eye, or you follow, you, you control it with your body and you imprint it and you learn that muscle memory and amazing things happen. Perfect. All right, our next question here is from Hiltgard, and they said they're making a king size quilt using charm packs. Should the squares and any sashes all run in the same grain? Well, you know, I, I, I could care less about grain when it comes to piecing the inside part of my quilt. When I get to the borders that are long borders that aren't pieced, then I'm concerned about grain. Um, quilts were made from scraps for years and years and years and years and years. And our foremothers basically cared, is that piece of fabric big enough for that unit? They didn't really think about which way the grain was going. Um, that being said, I tend to stay away from ever using something that's going to be on um, the bias, you know, because I don't want to deal with stretch. But um, as long as it's close to the crosswise or widthwise grain going in either direction, you're fine, you're, you're fine. It's gonna be just fine as long as you quilt it properly. <laughs> and quilting it properly, again, means every every inch to two inches at the most. Um, if, you're, if you quilt every four inches, then grain may play a, a role. Um, but if you're quilting it properly, then the grain does not. Right, perfect. Our next question here is from Christine. She says she's working on her first quilt, a scrappy quilt with some cotton and polyester fabrics. And she says she has problems getting the fabric tight to machine quilt. Some fabric stretched or puckered a bit, even though it was cut on the grain. Any hints of how to get the quilt stretched out better next time? Um, what was her name? Christine. Christine. Christine, Christine, please, 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 with your next quilt, only use cotton fabrics. Polyester fabrics and cotton poly blends all behave differently, and um, they do often have stretch to them. And having to... Uh, make those fabrics behave the same as the cotton fabrics is like asking an orange to go into an apple pie. And it just doesn't work. Um, it, it's making your job so much more difficult. Um, so for the next quilt, stick with all natural fibers, um, preferably all cotton. And for this quilt, um, you're gonna have some fullness. And so your best bet is um, when you reach an area that is stretched out, that is very full and, and is puckery, take a bunch of straight pins, silk pins, and the brand of silk pin that you need to purchase is either IBC or IRIS, I-R-I-S. No other brands because the other ones, they say they're silk pins, but they either have a glass head on them or they're not really silk pins. They're just fat short little pins. I don't even know what they are. But a silk pin is long and thin. And so what you're going to do is you're going to very carefully pin down that full area. You're going to push it down to the batting and pin and push and pin and push and pin until you've kind of eased out any fullness there. And then you're going to very slowly quilt in that area. It's the only way I know of. Um, if you can make it lay flat before you quilted it, then you can you can quilt it without any um, puckers or pleats. If you can't let, make it lay flat before you've quilted it, then there's gonna be puckers and pleats. And unfortunately, that is the nightmare of using polyester and polyester blend fabrics with cotton fabrics. Um, my grandmother was what, what, what I called a junk quilter. She quilted with any old junky fabric she could find. It, double knit, polyester, rayon, wool, cotton, all in the same quilt. But she tied all of her quilts. So, you know, you shouldn't have to worry about a little area of fullness here or a little area of tightness there. But when you machine quilt or hand quilt, those things are a big deal. So um, next time, stay away from those um, uh, man-made man fibers. You'll be much happier. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, next question here is, um, do you have to treat metallic thread for machine quilting or use a special needle? Yes, you both, actually. Um, you want to use a Metallica needle. 
Um, a Metallica needle has um, a Teflon coating inside the eye of the needle, which means less wear and tear because those metallic threads are usually a metallic fiber that's wrapped around an inner core, sometimes rayon, sometimes cotton, sometimes polyester. Um, and uh, then if you, if you continue to have any problems with it, if it's shredding or breaking, then there is a product called um, Sewer's Aid and it comes in a little squeeze bottle and you take your spool of thread and you hold it between your two fingers here and then you squeeze that sewer's aid in, in beads down the thread and it absorbs in a little ways and then you stitch for a while and then you do it some more and then you stitch for a while um, and that's a lubricant it's a it's a um, silicone lubricant that will help keep that thread from fraying or breaking so yeah metallica needle and sewer's aid absolutely all right and next question here is from jean she says she's working on a quilt that has many pieces that are cut out one and seven eighths inches and two and seven eighths inches. She has a two and a half inch square template, but when she cuts them out, they seem like they aren't exactly the size that she wants. Any suggestions as to marking my template so I can get the correct size? I saw that question earlier and it confused me a bit. Um, you have pieces that are one and seven eighths inch. And two and seven eighths inches. And two and seven eighths inch, but you have a template that's two and a half inches. Yes. So I'm not sure why you would use a two and a half inch template for pieces that are cut one and seven eighths and two and seven eighths. So I'm a little confused on that. Ashley, do you have any ideas here? My only thing is I'm thinking if you have, um, I'm envisioning you want to cut a small, smaller square, then you have a square ruler. So say you have like a, you want to cut a five inch block and you have a six inch square ruler or something. How do you move? around your fabric to make sure it's cut the size you want. That's the only thing I could think of with this one. Hmm. Well, um, if you have a two and a half inch square ruler, first of all, that's a tiny little ruler and it's hard to work with. Um, those rulers were really designed for marking seam allowances and things like that. They really weren't designed for cutting from because you're going to cut yourself. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, my assumption is, is that, um, well, generally speaking, this is how I would cut those. I would cut one and seven eighths inch strips and two and seven eighths inch strips. And then I would, you know, turn them lengthwise and cut them down into one and seven eighths inch units and two and seven eighths inch units. Um, seven eighths inch is a ridiculously difficult cut. Um, why somebody would design with that cut, I'm not quite sure. Um, it's hard to do and it's hard to make consistent. So it's it's not for beginners. If you're an absolute beginner, you this is a tough quilt for you. Um, one of the things that you can do is you can mark that 7 eighths inch with tape. If you put a piece of blue tape right at that 7 eighths inch so that you can constantly go right back to where that edge of that tape is instead of having to read that ruler every single time, that can make it a lot easier. I've been doing that for years. You can also just use a black Sharpie or a bright purple Sharpie and mark that line too because Sharpie comes off your ruler with alcohol. Um, so it's another way to mark your ruler. But marking your ruler will make those cuts probably more accurate and make the cutting probably more quick. Perfect. All right, our next question here, um, how can you keep your sewing machine foot pedal from moving while you're sewing? Mm. Um, probably one of the, if you, I, I'm assuming you're sewing on a hardwood floor or something like that. Um, probably one of the best bets that you can do is you can take a spray adhesive and a piece of sandpaper and you, you spray the back of the sandpaper with some, with the adhesive and stick it to the bottom of your foot so that the sandpaper is hitting the, the floor. Now, if you've got a really nice hardwood floor, I would put a mat down first <laughs> so that you don't end up with a sanded area on your hardwood floor. If you've got tile or linoleum, it'll be fine. You can also get these little um, uh, clear rubber round things that are sticky on one side that are, that are for your rulers to keep your rulers from sliding. You can stick those to the bottom of your foot too, and those really work. Those are very helpful. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, our next question here, is there a right and wrong side to batting? Uh, no, no. No, there's no right or wrong side. Um, some brands, there's a side that's prettier, but it's not right or wrong. And if you can, if when you smooth your hand over batting, if you feel nubs in the batting and it feels nubby and bumpy, you're going to feel nubby and bumpy in your quilt. So probably not the batting that you want to use. Yeah, there's no right or wrong side. Perfect. All right. Our next question here is from 
um, to Nia, and she says, what is the easiest way to attach cheesecloth to a base fabric? Can I use a fusible or should it be sewn on? Um, you can use a fusible, but only one. Uh, and that would be Misty Fuse. Misty Fuse is very, very, very sheer. I've used it many, many, many times with, with um, cheesecloth. However, I've also stitched it down many, many, many times without using an iron-on adhesive. Um, and when I do that, I tend to at least do some lines with my regular foot rather than my free motion foot so that it doesn't get caught in that free motion foot. Um, but I've done it both ways, but Misty Fuse is the way to go. It's really kind of cool because you can put it on the back of that cheesecloth and it's slightly sticky and then you can crumple that cheesecloth up and it will hold its shape, trying to keep that Misty Fuse all on the back. It'll hold its shape while you put it in place and then iron it down and then you've got this wonderful, you know, texturized area. Um, so yeah, Misty Fuse and cheesecloth, one of my favorite combinations. <laughs> Perfect. All right, now you touched on this next subject just a little bit before when talking about the different um, thread colors to use in quilting batiks. Um, but the question here, they say, I have several quilt tops. I would like to machine quilt on my home machine. They have some very light areas and some very dark areas. What color thread do I use? I match the color of my thread to the fabrics I'm sewing on. I have quilts where I've changed my thread color, I don't know, 300 times. I, I'm using only 12 or 15 threads, but I have to change it according to where I'm at on the quilt. Um, I don't mind changing my thread color. I like my thread colors to, to go away. I like them to not be the dominant thing. That is what I like. If you like your thread to show, then choose something that slightly contrasts. Do not choose a high contrast unless you are a fabulous, fabulous, way better than me machine quilter. So um, I, I tend to keep it as simple as possible thread color wise. But if I've got a quilt that has, um, uh, that's mostly blue and yellow, but there's lots of different blues and lots of different yellows. And there's lots of different values of those blues and lots of different values of those yellows. I will choose a medium valued blue that's slightly dull, a tone, and a medium valued yellow that's slightly grayed out, a tone. And those are what I would quilt those two areas with. The things that are blue, I would quilt with the blue, and the things that are yellow, I would quilt with the yellow. Um, but I nine times out of, or 99.9 .9 times out of 100, I'm matching my thread to my fabrics. So then if you are changing your thread that many times when you're quilting, how do you secure the ends and beginnings and all of those Change. I got off just like I normally would. I bring the and I always match my bobbin thread to my top thread too. So that's something that a lot of people don't do. But then I don't have to worry about my tension not being perfect all the time or any any issue of you know if I'm going in a fast circle, the bobbin thread being drawn up or the top thread being drawn down. So I always match my bobbin thread. Uh, that being said, I've got like you know 200 bobbins, so I've got enough bobbins for all the thread. Um, so what I you know when I start and stop, I when I start, I pull the bobbin thread up through the surface of the quilt. I hold those two threads, the top thread and the bobbin thread, and I stitch these little micro stitches right next to each other in place, about three stitches, and then I just go stitch and I clip those threads flush. When I'm done, I do the same thing. I back and forth ever so slightly, um, and three or four times, cut those threads flush, and then move on to the next one. So this you always, you always cut flush? Some people, like... Some people will take and thread the thread and try to yeah, hide it in the middle. I, no, mm -mm. I was I had to write a, a resume the other or, or or add to my resume the other day, and I had to really really think so that I wasn't um, exaggerating uh, much, if if at all. Um, how many quilted projects I've finished in my life, and um, it's somewhere between twenty five hundred and three thousand, and. To finish those many projects, um, if I hand tied things off, I'd still be back on project number 14. So um, I don't hand tie off. No, that's that's something that people do that are highly into competition. Well, that's just what I was envisioning when you said that many thread changes. I was I <laughs> not <laughs> wanting to even I, I imagine that. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Well, I want to thank you once again for being here to answer all of our quilting yeah, questions. It was fun as usual. That's good. I'm glad. And we will see you again next month. And I hope everyone tunes in next month and has even more questions. And we will continue um, having you educate everyone with all their quilting. All right. See you guys in May. <laughs> Sounds good. See ya.